We have another great speaker who has made his experience both in Europe and in the US. So he has worked as a technology executive at famous companies such as Sun Microsystems, Microsoft, and then he has switched sides to become a venture capitalist as the famous fund Excel. And he has now started his own fund, uh, Oxton Ventures. Please welcome Jose Kenji. And uh, he will talk about why good businesses aren't impressive enough for VCs. So I'm very excited to hear that. Thank, Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I'm a VC, so I don't actually do real work for a living, so I haven't built slides. Um, that's what all the entrepreneurs usually say about, about us on, on our side of the table. Um, so very quick uh, intro, so I was out in Silicon Valley for a number of years. Uh, I did a number of companies, some of them successful, some of them not so successful. Uh, and then I switched uh, sides and, and actually moved over to London uh, and joined a really big venture capital firm uh, called Axel Partners. Spent about four years with those guys uh, learning how to invest and then like all entrepreneurs got itchy feet and decided to leave and go set up my own firm. So I'm both a founder and a VC. It's a brand new VC. We're about two years old. We manage about $40 million. We invest all across Europe. Um, and we have uh, a pretty good early stage portfolio right now. I think the aggregate value of our companies, if you add them all up, in terms of their market cap is about a billion and a half today. Uh, so in about two and a half years, the companies have been worth uh, quite a bit of money, I guess. Um, so let me, let me uh, I guess the, the classic conundrum that I always see, especially in Europe, uh, across European entrepreneurs, is uh, people don't always know what VCs are looking for. So let me kind of try and break down the VC business model. Uh, how many of you guys know how VCs actually work or how, how we actually do our business on, on our side of the table? Just a show of hands. Okay, that's what I thought. So the couple of people in Silicon Valley is about it, and a couple of people who built businesses before. Uh, so let me, let me explain what VCs actually do. So first of all, we don't manage our own money, uh, although usually a portion of the money inside of our funds is ours. It's usually third-party money. Most of it is institutional investors, usually uh, the likes of university endowments in the, in the United States, uh, who are very long-term investors. So just imagine that you're Harvard or Yale or Princeton. You have tons and tons of money in your university endowment. You're trying to grow that endowment. You actually don't need to cash. Harvard's not going to get any poorer uh, if it makes or loses any money. And it usually takes about 2% of its overall kind of uh, overall kind of uh, bucket of, of dollars and investment into private equity and, and, and venture capital, unfortunately, goes into the early stage market. Now, they give us and entrust us with that money. Um, our job is we're, we're probably the riskiest thing that these guys will do. Uh, so you know we're thinking about investing in companies, but but in their mind, risk is actually giving money to folks like us. And, and for that privilege of the risk, and we, we tend to hold this money for about 10 years. Uh, so for that risk, we're, we're usually expected to somewhere between triple to quadruple their money. So you know, they give us, let's make the math really easy, they give us $100 million, right? They're expecting about $300 million to $400 million back uh, in about 10 years. They don't care about the timing because they don't need the cash, but that's kind of the bar. Uh, and we as a venture fund, they're supposed to take this money and triple or quadruple it over, over kind of our, our, our portfolio of investments. Now, if you just think about this, most venture guys will typically invest in companies and will own somewhere between 10% on the low end to probably 30% on the high end uh, of a company over the life of the company. We're not majority investors, we don't try to control companies, and we're minorities, and because companies keep raising more and more money, we get diluted just like, just like founders do. Uh, so let's just make the math really easy and assume we kind of own 20% of our companies. Uh, this makes the math uh, reasonably easy. Suppose we you know, split up our 100 million bucks and we invest into about 20 companies. That's usually how venture guys kind of split up. It's usually about 20 to 20 to 25 companies uh, per fund. If you're a bigger fund, it might be closer to 40, but let's just assume 20. So we now own about 20% of, of the overall value of our companies, which means if we have to turn 100 million into 400 million and we own 20% of our companies across the fund, the number's pretty easy, just multiply by five. So we have to create about two billion in market cap uh, across, our, across our portfolio in order just to be able to meet the bar, right? That's a, to kind of, if you're gonna grade us, you know, that's to kind of get a B plus or an A minus, that's not even an A fund. Now, that's a lot of money to make over the course of a very short amount of time. Uh, you know, 10 years is, is, pretty, is pretty short. So the only way for us to actually get a chance of doing this kind of stuff is to invest in companies. Uh, and I remember one of, the, one of the interesting things about venture is venture is not consistent. No matter how good you think you are at venture capital, you're by definition going to lose a lot of money. Uh, mostly because you invest in the right kind of company and the timing doesn't uh, work out the right way. Where you invest in a company, Google decides it's going to build something 
something tomorrow that's doing exactly the same thing. And the, the failure rate in our industry is about 50 to 60%. It's kind of interesting because it doesn't make a difference whether you're investing very, very, very early or you're investing slightly later. There's a bunch of data that came out from a fund of funds called Horsley Bridge. And, and the failure rate is pretty much consistent across the industry. It's about 50 to 60% no matter what stage you're investing in. So if you're investing like this and you're not consistent, uh, it's very difficult to turn your $100 million into, into, into $2 billion of, of market cap for your companies, especially if most of your companies are going to go away. Which means that the magnitude of your companies when they actually win has to be so big that it has to pretty much be able to justify returning the fund. Now, most of us expect that most of our companies are not going to have that kind of magnitude. It's going to be a handful of those companies, maybe one, maybe two, that are going to generate virtually all the returns in, in our portfolio. The reason being, like I said, is most of our companies kind of, you know, don't go anywhere. So it's the, it's the one or two that kind of go somewhere that actually generate all those returns. So that sets a pretty darn high bar for, for you as an entrepreneur, right? If you're coming into a venture capital firm and you're asking for money, right? The venture capital firm is thinking, okay, can that entrepreneur, can that company basically create all the value uh, in my fund? And if not, I'm not going to invest because I only have about 20 of these darts that I can use, and I better make sure that one of these darts hits the bullseye, and the bullseye being that magical number of kind of you know, being able to generate all my returns. Uh, now, I think we as entrepreneurs are often trained to think about, look, am I building something that's actually compelling? Do I have a good user interface? Do I have a good product? Do I have a good kind of product market fit? You know, am I building something that's actually interesting that the customer is going to use? Am I going to be able to charge money for this thing? You know, is someone actually going to pay me to use my service? Uh, and you know, am I going to get to cash flow or even am I going to actually become a profitable business over time? You know, am I going to be able to generate real returns uh, for, a, for, a, for an investor? That's usually how most of us kind of think about the business and a lot of the business is about hiring, etc. As a venture guy, that's good, but that doesn't justify the investment bar for us, right? What justifies the investment bar for us is if I invest in something like this, you know, could it actually return this you know, ridiculously large sum of money back to my fund in order to get that three or four X kind of return that I need across the entire fund? So what we're mostly betting on as venture guys is brand new industries, brand new markets where we think a brand new company can actually do that. And if you look at the history of technology, it's usually these disruptive shifts in the tech industry where new market opportunities get created and it's usually a newer company that kind of comes into the market and, and captures a lot of that value. Uh, so what we're looking for is those kinds of companies. So it's not the business plan necessarily. It's not how good your product is. It's not how good the market is. It's not how good the team is. It's, it's really that magnitude of the, of the, of the company. You know, is this going to turn into something that's super, super interesting? And the other thing is we're basically mostly momentum investors, right? So where do, where do valuations, where do things that are interesting really kind of get mispriced in the market? Uh, and they usually get mispriced when they're brand new markets that are kind of, kind of being created. So when there's a brand new service or product that gets created, a lot of people in the world don't understand how, how much or how, how valuable the, the product actually is. And it's kind of consistent across the financial markets is you typically get a big spike in valuations in the early days of a product being built. So, you know, right now we've kind of heard a lot about augmented reality or virtual reality, right? Nobody really understands what these businesses are going to be worth 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now. And if and there's this there's this huge thing in the investment community called fear of missing out. It's the same exact thing that millennials have. Um, and so you want to be in these deals. And to be fair, if you're a bigger company, you kind of want to have these products or services, which usually means that you tend to overpay for these things. And, and so for a venture firm, these are really interesting because this is where you get extraordinarily value extraordinary value creation, not often built on fundamentals, but based on kind of market momentum. So you're looking for businesses that are kind of on this intersection of brand new market, right? Uh, so brand new industry that's being formed, and, and, and an industry which nobody in the world really kind of understands, and people are willing to misprice it. And usually in the early days, people tend to misprice it on the high end, especially if there are a lot of people who feel that they're missing out, because that means there's a supply-demand imbalance, and there's a lot more demand for this for, for being an investor in something like this. And the classic example today, we were talking about this a couple of nights ago, is Uber is very similar to this, right? Is Uber really worth $50 billion? Who the hell knows? But that, that valuation has gone up exponentially very, very, very fast, right? And it, it kind of ignores the fact that, at least if you're Uber, you know, most of the value when you're doing these financial calculations is usually in something called terminal value, where you kind of 
plot out all the cash that the company's going to make and you discount it back to present value and a lot of it's in the final year because you can't really expect the 50, 100 years. Right? The biggest risk for Uber is that self-driving cars kind of come around, right? I and mean, who knows what terminal value actually looks like? Who knows if Uber is going to own that market or if someone else is going to own that market like Google? But because there's so much money that wants to, put, that, uh, wants to invest into Uber right now, the price has kept going up and up and up. Uh, and this usually happens. This happens a lot in brand new markets. So we're looking for these brand new disruptive markets where a company can kind of succeed, uh, where there's not an incumbent necessarily who's gonna take over, and we're looking for these markets which get massively overvalued, and that's really what we're looking for at the end of the day, much more so than the fundamental health of the business. So I think classically what happens with entrepreneurs is they typically think about the business in terms of, you know, again, here's my product, here's my service, here's why I'm different than everybody else, here's why people are gonna pay me money, here's why I'm gonna get to revenue, and, and, and venture guys, may or may not actually find any of that stuff interesting, because if there isn't this kind of market sizing behind it, you're not gonna get these exponential kind of returns. And, and it's, a, it's a big gap, so, and again, I think it all, it, all, it all kind of boils down to how we end up managing money for our investors. We have a very, very high bar in terms of our returns. Uh, it, we're, like I said, we're the riskiest thing that these guys invest in because we're the riskiest thing that, that, that these guys invest in. We have to generate the most returns for them. And you can only do that if a company kind of, kind of scales up exponentially. So if you look at the, the history of venture, right, you'll, you'll see a lot, of, a lot of us will be backing these next generation markets. Mostly because if you kind of get this stuff right, and, and, and failure doesn't really make that much of a difference here, right? Because if you assume like 50, 60% of your portfolio is not going to actually produce any returns, it's the, the emphasis is really on that one company that's actually going to that's actually going to make it. So the, the failure rate is actually not what you think about. It. You think about the, the scale of the of the success more than more than anything else. Uh, and I think this is the classic kind of disconnect between entrepreneurs and VCs. So I think it's helpful to understand how the venture model works kind of behind the scenes because the next time you're pitching someone like us, you know, the questions that you really should be thinking about is, you know, is this a large market? A lot of these new markets in the early days, it's very fuzzy, right? And you don't actually know how the markets are gonna play out. So you're looking for these brand new markets where again, things kind of get mispriced down the line, down, down the line because people, people want to invest and, and, and focus less probably on the, on the actual fundamentals of the business. Um, and then the one thing that I'd probably mention uh, as well is from, from a venture perspective, again, because we're very much in a market-oriented uh, environment where you can pick and choose money from everybody else, we are, at the end of the day, very much like lemmings and very much like sheep. So if we think the guy who's just as smart as us down the road somewhere else at another prestigious venture firm gets really excited about your business, right, it makes us want to take the company a lot more seriously because we think to ourselves, we're actually not that smart. That guy's really smart. If he sees something, what am I missing? And we work really hard to try and catch up. And all of this, all of this can be socially engineered. Uh, so the best way to do this is to make sure you kind of drop you know, enough smart people in the industry that you're interested in, kind of get the right kind of decision makers in our industry kind of talking about it. No different than the music industry, no different than the film industry. People start talking about your company, and all of a sudden it feels like as a venture guy, you're the last one there, and you're, you're kind of missing out. And you, you work like hell in those, kinds of, in those kinds of scenarios to catch up to everybody else. And if, you're, if your company has a good shot of being kind of one of these outliers, um, then you work extra special hard and, and, and it actually kind of all, all, all kind of comes together. So I thought I would end there and kind of take questions from the audience uh, uh, to kind of give you more, more insight as to, as to what goes on in the venture side. Any, anybody? Yeah. Can you, can you give us an example of uh, this social, social engineer stuff that you were talking about already? So, so the question is, am I gonna, am I gonna, so we, um, so we, we got a call a few years ago, and this is when I was at Excel, so I'll use my old firm, so, and, and all VCs kind of get socially engineered all the time, we just don't like talking about it. Um, and and, and uh, the former CEO of Atari, who's a good video game guy, uh, brought us something saying, look, this is one of the more interesting companies. Uh, at the time, this country was building basically social games on top of Facebook. So we all know kind of social games on top of Facebook, Farmville, Candy Crush, etc. are now kind of popular. Back then, there was nobody there. There was one of the first companies in that space. Um, so he knew this space a little bit better than we did. Then we got a call from someone inside of Facebook, maybe about two weeks later. Then we got a call from someone else inside the video game industry. And all of a sudden, you know, it wasn't clear at the time that we were being played, right? We just thought, you know, wow, look, this is a great company and all the smart people are coming and talking to us. But believe me, the entrepreneur is doing this stuff like three or four other firms at exactly the same time. And they're all kind of dropping little hints 
uh, to say this is a really interesting company in a brand new space and we have to go figure out the word. And it goes back to this thing. We had no idea what the social gaming space looked like, right? We just knew that it was a brand new market and that chances are because it was a brand new market, the big incumbents in that space with kind of a Sony, Nintendo, Electronic Arts, et cetera, would not really understand it. They'd probably underinvest in it. And then probably about a year later, if it turned out to be a good market, they'd all have to scramble and catch up. And you know, one year later, we were really lucky that company got to 40 million users uh, globally. This seems like a small number today, or maybe it's a, it's a big number, but it's a small number in the context of Candy Crush and Farmville. Um, but it turned out to, to grow really fast, and Electronic Arts came in and offered a number, uh, it was about $400 million with the year now, uh, to kind of basically play catch up. And when they acquired the company, the guys who were running the company basically took over a large chunk of the social part uh, of, of EA, because EA was very much behind the times when it came to that stuff. And so again, we got that mispricing. So the company was two years old and got acquired for 400 million bucks. Now that sounds like a really good number, but you have to remember that Zynga was basically the same age when public went for two billion, and then the eventual winner in that space was King of Commons, you know, worth about five or six billion today. So you know, big numbers, but all fundamentally on the same market, which is brand new market, right? And then the founders there were pretty good about social engineering. Um. You said your investor is expected three or four times in 10 years. Yep. Uh, do they care about the valuation or they expect actual returns? So they, they leave the valuation worries to kind of us as the venture firm, right? So the, the question again, it goes back to this, you know, what, what's a company really worth in the early days? And the, and the answer is none of us really kind of know, right? If you massively, massively overpay for something, you know, what ends up happening is if you only say invest five million and the company's worth a hundred million instead of owning twenty percent, you own five percent. But the truth is if that company turns out to be a fifty billion dollar company, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. And obviously you kind of wish you put ten million dollars instead of five million dollars, but that's a quality problem. Now if the company turns out to be a fifty million dollar company, then you really care about kind of ownership. And I think this is one of the big structural disadvantages in Europe is we don't have a lot of ten billion, fifty billion, hundred billion dollar companies, so people here on the investment side really optimize for all, all kinds of value in terms of taking as much of the company as possible, in terms of putting all kinds of preference rights in so, so they get, you know, they get back money, you know, at multiple, you know, even in a, in a small case scenario. You know, when you have really large companies and you're betting, you know, venture is all about betting on the right companies and the right big companies, because if you bet on the right big company, it doesn't make that much of a difference on the valuation side, within reason. Um. Once there's this landing effect that you were talking about, and we all know this, then this is a lucky company because everyone is talking about them. Most of the companies have to start at a point of founders where they don't have the attention. What was the last business plan or a type of business that really caught your attention and really surprised you and you thought at the first glance, I have to be into that? So, so the last one that we just did, which kind of feels feels that way to us, and, and, and again, I think you know the hard part about venture is we're trying to figure out what market is going to get hot, not today, but when a year or two, five years down the line, when, when these markets actually get really hot to the wider market. Generally, in our market, if there isn't a name for the industry, and it turns out to be a name for the industry in five years, you know, you kind of picked well. So this whole idea of social sharing or on-demand economy, you know, if there's like a three-letter acronym or a buzzword, you kind of, and, and you, you invested before everyone knew what the buzzword was, you've probably done a good job. And that's, that's really what we're trying to do. Um, the last one that we did was in the compliance software space. You know, we're big believers that, uh, at least in the financial services industry, which is a terrible place to work these days for a lot of reasons, but one of the big reasons is compliance. The governments are putting these regulations, you can't do a lot of things. You know, basically the only growth engine in, 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 in financial services today is the compliance people. So basically people who are reading other people's emails and trying to figure out if they're doing something bad and finance people do a lot of bad things. Um, so there was a team that actually built, uh, is building a product in that space and doing this all on an automated basis. And it's the second time around and the, the really cool thing is it's three different people from three different companies all of whom were competitors the last time. They've all kind of formed one, like it's kind of like Voltron, they've come back together, and this time they're all aligned and they're trying to build a big company in that space. Should we? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Can I have a quick one? So, <laughs> just a guy no, I think we're, we're over time already, sorry about that. Find me outside. I'll so be outside. That's the, the final question that I have. People in the audience who want to talk to you either for advice or potential investment, 
can they get hold of you and what's the best way? So, so super easy. We're, we're big believers that these next generation industries are often done by new guys. So I'm on Twitter at hkanji, uh, H-K-A-N-J-I. Uh, my email address is Hussein, it's a little bit harder, H-U-S-S-E-I-N at, at hoxton.vc. So very, very easy to get hold of. How, how about Hoxton? How did you choose that name? So, I'm trying to figure out what that means. Okay, so this, this one's a little bit long. So when, I, when we were setting up the fund, there are two of us who set up the fund, we're both Americans. Um, we wanted to call it the Gray Squirrel Investment Company. The reason why the Gray Squirrel is an American squirrel and the Red Squirrel is the English squirrel. The Gray Squirrels have taken over England. If you, if, you're, if you want to look a funny article, just Google Red Squirrel, Gray Squirrel. There are these wars going on and there are people who are basically funding societies to protect the Red Squirrel. So we're American, and we thought it would be kind of funny to come in to England and call ourselves the Gray Squirrel Investment Company. Uh, it's a clear signal to the market that we thought the market was a little bit slow. My, my business partner, who's much wiser than me, said this is very juvenile, uh, you should not do this. And he said, we're going to pick the name of the neighborhood that we're working from, which is Hoxton, which we no longer can afford because it's gotten so trendy and so cool that we're priced out. Okay, that's a great story. Thank you so much for coming.